Okay, so good morning. Good morning. And uh, let me do a full screen mode so you can see that. Last time I noticed I was moving the uh, cursor too many times. So tell me if that is happening mm -hmm. today. Uh, I want to be, I'm using this time rather than OneNote, I'm using a PDF just to see if that streamlines things a little more. Okay, so the, I want to start out with this news that we all got this mo uh, late uh, last night. Um, Phil Anderson, who was a giant in the field of physics, passed away uh, on Sunday morning. Um, so I'm sure all of us have heard about him and all of you have heard about him. Some of the main ideas that we are using in this course come from uh, ideas that Phil Anderson pushed in a major way. And that was his idea of more is different and the concept of emergence. So I want to say a few words about how we see this in our lectures. So for example, uh, the, we have been talking about magnetic order, right? So this long range order, and that is something which is an emergent property. Because if you look at um, not just a magnet, but take a crystal or a superfluid or a superconductor, all of these have some properties at the individual level, which are, so, so basically you start out with individual level properties, okay. but what you get out are emergent properties which are quite different. So a simple example here would be something like rigidity of a solid, right? When you take an atom, there's nothing like rigidity of an atom, but you put many atoms together, when they form a crystal, that's when it starts to show this rigidity property where it resists bending or shearing motion like we were talking about. And the same thing happens in a magnet. There is long range magnetic order which will resist any kind of uh, transverse a magnetic susceptibility can be a probe of that or the superfluid stiffness. So this whole idea that when you take many interacting atoms or electrons, you get new kinds of organizations that are different from the individual was a big idea that Anderson proposed. And so this picture here uh, is a picture from his 90th birthday celebration six years ago. He was 96 when he died. And it I'm not able to see the screen actually. You can't? Me neither. I can't either. Yeah, it's just black. Yeah, I can. I just see a black screen. Ah, let me yeah. say stop sharing and then restart. I'm glad you said this before the end of the whole class today. Okay, now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so this picture was from his six years ago from his birthday and it shows a number of other luminaries. You know, there's um, Tony Leggett, and um, Walter Cohn, Dan Sui, um, uh, Ed Witten, uh, Wilczek, and Doug Osheroff. And all of them have gotten Nobel Prizes. Uh, uh, Witten got the Fields Medal. So this was his illustrious birthday six years ago. And I, per I personally knew Anderson pretty well. Um, you know, I'll tell you stories later. Right now, I think I want to delve into the uh, into the lecture today. Okay, so um, uh, just I want to mention two things. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize again for two topics we have touched on in this course. One is for his work on magnetic uh, systems, and he was really concerned ab about the mechanism that leads to magnetism. So, you know, we just put a J in front of these interacting Hamiltonians. What is the mechanism that generates this J? This is something he worked on. And he shared a Nobel Prize with uh, uh, Mott and Van Vleck. And he also did um, 
very the pioneering work on Anderson localization that we talked about. Um, now, some of you may not know this, uh, but he was the first person to talk about the Higgs mechanism. Um, so we have talked about the O2 model, right? The Mexican hat. And it has two kinds of modes. The amplitude mode, which is like increasing the length of that spin or reducing the length of the spin. And that costs some energy. It's a gap mode. Uh, that's called the Higgs mode. Uh, the other mode is the uh, phase mode, which we uh, have been calling a phase mode, but it's also called the Goldstone mode. And the Anderson uh, mechanism, uh, what is now called the Higgs mechanism, was something was a uh, occurs in superconductors. And people who are doing superconductivity, maybe in Mohit's course, have talked about the penetration, the London penetration depth, which is the length scale over which a magnetic field um, penetrates the superconductor. So typically in a superconductor, all magnetic field will be expelled, but it's expelled over a certain length scale uh, in the superconductor. And that's called the penetration depth. And that length scale, so your, um, your, your magnetic field enters the superconductor as e to the minus L over C, so it's exponentially suppressed with some length scale C, and that can be thought of as a mass, right? Inverse length is like a mass. And so that's the mechanism, that's the Higgs mechanism as we call it today, but the idea came first two years before Higgs uh, from Anderson as a mechanism by which the photon acquires a mass and hence gives you exponential decay of the magnetic field. So um, yeah, so he, these are just two things I mentioned today uh, as we remember him for uh, you know, literally transforming uh, the field of physics. And it's not just condensed matter physics, it's really all of physics. Okay, so let me get into the talk, uh, the plan for today. Um, there were a few loose ends I had to tie up for the costless thaulus transition, and I'm going to do that at a later point. I will combine some ideas from here and that, and I will kind of uh, correlate that and combine it later. But I want to start today with this new topic of quantum phase transitions. So far, we have been talking about classical phase transitions driven by thermal fluctuations, right? So we have an ordered state, an ordered magnet, and it becomes disordered due to thermal fluctuations. Today, we'll talk about um, phenomena that can happen at zero temperature. So you've completely um, quenched any thermal fluctuations, and yet we will see you can have a phase transition. So that's a very exciting new topic that we begin today. Uh, sorry, this should have been A, B, C. Uh, there are three paradigmatic models we will discuss. Um, you know, these models are very useful, just like the Ising model that we spend so much energy on. Um, these models help us understand much bigger issues about the field, but in a very concrete way. So we like models, but we also understand that, you know, we throw away things uh, about real systems but we also know that the things we throw away are not that important. We understand in an RG sense, we are keeping the essential degrees in a model. So that's a very important thing of using RG in our physics explorations more broadly. It's not just about taking a model and doing RG on it. It's even the way we think about physics when we construct models. Uh, that we keep the essential elements in the model. That itself is a kind of RG. So I'm going to discuss three models as we go along. The transverse field Ising model. This will be a way to understand a magnetic to paramagnetic transition, but it will be a quantum paramagnet. 
The second one will be a Josephson Junction Array model. And it's a way of understanding the phenomena of superconductor to insulator transition. And the third is a Bose-Hubbard model, uh, which will help us understand superfluid to MOT transitions. Okay, so that's the plan. Today I will do just uh, the A part of it in, uh, in, in the lecture today. Okay, so um, let's start with, uh, with um, let me see if I can, um, I want to minimize this little box at the top. Okay, um, okay, never mind. I can't see the very top of my, oh yeah, here. Okay. Okay. So um, I've written down uh, a very simple Hamiltonian. Can you all see that? It's a kind of an Ising model looking Hamiltonian. Yes. Okay. So the Hamiltonian is, lit is literally our beloved Ising model with the Z component of these. Now these are operators the Pauli matrices. So the Z components are interacting on neighboring sites. And I have a second term, which is a field that couples to sigma X. Okay, so this is a, a typical a quantum Hamiltonian where you have two kinds of operators that don't commute with each other. I'm sorry to interrupt. Have you uploaded this note in the files? Yes. Okay. Do you see it? No, I couldn't find it. I mean, what was is? It should be the very last file I uploaded under modules. It's always sequential. So see, Sandeep, if you can. Nishal, yeah. did you find it? I yeah, found it. I think it's called March, March 30 lecture. Okay. Okay, yeah. 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 Thank you. Right. So um, basically, what I'm trying to uh, show you is the typical structure of a model that will show a quantum phase transition. So essentially, in a quantum phase transition, you can imagine you are at zero temperature, so there are no thermal fluctuations, and yet something will drive a transition. What is that something? That something is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, that, will, that, that kicks in when you have two operators that don't commute, right? So that is what you're going to do, is that you have a Hamiltonian which has Z Pauli matrices and X Pauli matrices. And as a function of H divided by J, that's your dimensionless parameter. Remember, whenever we did classical phase transitions, our tuning parameter was, what was the tuning parameter? Anybody? Temperature. Pardon? Temperature. Temperature, but what was the dimensionless tuning parameter? Temperature over J. Temperature over J. Exactly. So we always think of a dimensionless tuning parameter. That was what then also entered the RG and the, uh, re and the renormalization uh, scaling of that RG, which, which was the coupling beta times J. So basically uh, J over temperature or temperature over J, that's our tuning parameter. So here, our tuning parameter will be H divided by J or J over H, whatever. But it's that dimensionless parameter. So let's scroll down a bit. This doesn't let me, okay, maybe even if I can't scroll down, uh, you can see down, right? You can see in your notes. So my horizontal axis is H divided by J. And what you will see is in the phase at small H, there will be uh, essentially a quantum phase transition is a restructuring of the ground state, okay? Because now we are looking at a many body ground state and the many body ground state at zero temperature is 
has a certain structure for small h, there's a ground state with a gap. And that gap is what I'm calling delta OP. It's just a gap. And at some critical h, that gap closes. And now another gap opens, which is a description of the new ground state at large h and its excitations. So if you can just understand this one picture, it encapsulates the main idea of a quantum phase transition. So let me stop here and just see if you have questions. You're saying at the uh, QCP, the gap between the ground state and the next highest energy state closes? Yes. Okay. From both sides. Okay, so there is a particular ground state on the left at small h, and there's an excitation. That excitation gap closes. There's a different ground state. You see, for the system to reconstruct from one ground state to another, the, this is the way to think about it. You have a whole spectrum, right, for your many body Hamiltonian. If you want to restructure the ground state, you somehow have to mix everything. And that mixing is uh, greatly facilitated if there's no gap, you see? So that's why the gap closes, all the states mix, a new ground state forms, and it has now a gap to its new excitation, and that gap grows as you go toward larger and larger H. So why are we assuming that both states are, gap, are gapped? Um, there will be some energy scale. In, they need not both be gapped. I'm giving a particular simpler example first. And um, we will see that even if they are not gapped, there is some energy scale, like a stiffness or some energy scale which can close. Uh, what is this terminology delta OP? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I have just, I am a little bit um, using a terminology I will bring in later. I'm calling it order parameter. Okay. So for now, you can, in this simple example of um, the transfer spherizing model, you will see there will be uh, just a gap. You can call it delta gap one and delta gap two. In some other problems, it may not be a gap, it may be a gapless state, but there could be another energy scale. And again, with this idea of gap closing, gap means like ex uh, uh, the difference between the ground state and next excitation. Yes. So is it just only two states that's getting mixed or you, you just said, you know, all the states are getting mixed. So, I mean. Right. So all the states are getting mixed to form a new ground state. So right. doesn't it mean that the whole spectrum collapse to one or? Yeah, the spe so there are many variations on the theme. Okay. Uh, the simple variation on the theme is that the entire spectrum collapses. Okay. That allows all the states to mix with new weights. Uh, and so you have like a psi ground state, which is, you know, think of some basis uh, states, right? You can describe using those basis states, you can describe the ground state on the left with some coefficients. You can use the same basis states and describe the ground state on the right with a different set of coefficients, right? So Think of the entire spectrum collapsing, new mixings happening, and then a gap opens up. Is the collapsing happening because it becomes scale invariant at the critical point, so there isn't a way to pick out the different energy eigenstates? Yes, it'll become scale invariant. So writing on this is also a correlation length, just like what we saw in the finite temperature transition, there will be a correlation length which will diverge from both sides, which essentially goes like one over the gap. Okay. So um, in this case, uh, for the phase corresponding to like large and small H, does so H is driving 
the strength of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, essentially, right? Yeah. So for large H, we're looking at something that's like a big superposition, whereas for small H, it, it might be like just a product state. Or so something we'll like come that. to that now. So in both extremes, it becomes like, a, you know, if I just gave you H was zero, this becomes like a classical model. In the other extreme, it's another, it's even a simpler model because if you don't have the J term, it's just sigma I X, that's, you can call it sigma I Z for all you care, it's any basis. So that's even like non-interacting spins. So the two limits are very easy to understand, but it's the middle that will be interesting. Okay, so let me move on. And uh, you will see uh, there will be um, different examples I will give. Okay. So this is the part that was getting cut off, but you can see it now. Okay. So um, here I have uh, addressed a few things that came up uh, that the order parameter goes like delta, which is now going to be the deviation from the critical point. Typically we will use G to signal, to signify the tuning parameter. So in various experiments, G is a non-thermal tuning parameter. It can be the field, it can be in typical experiments, it can be pressure, uh, it can be strain, anything that is non-thermal. So G minus G critical over G critical, that's the tuning parameter. And again, the order parameter exponent is beta. Uh, the length scale will also diverge, delta to the minus nu, okay? Just like a finite uh, temperature transition. But in a quantum transition, there's one new uh, scale that diverges. And that is the time scale. We never talked about time in a classical transition. Here we will see that in a quantum transition, we cannot ignore the time. So the time will also diverge uh, with what is called the dynamical exponent, xi to the power z, or delta to the power minus z nu, okay? What do you mean by time divergence? Can you be- I'm going to come into that. I'm going to explain what this time is, okay? Um, so I'll, that is going to be the whole uh, effort is to understand what is this time. If you want a quick answer right now, it will be a way of understanding tunneling events. Okay, so um, basically what you have are, let's say your system is in one, so think classically, we had, for example, free energies that had, let's say two minima. And if the system is in one of the minima, that's where it will sit. Um, it classically, but quantum mechanically, it can tunnel into the other minimum, right? So that is what this time is. It's going to be tunneling events that will um, basically allow the system to go between several classical states. Okay. Um, so when you say several classical state, I mean, it's like, are you, do you mean like there's a ground state degeneracy? Yeah, there's a ground state degeneracy and it can go between those degenerate states. Okay. And again, depending on the symmetry, it could be just two degenerate states or many degenerate states and so on. So the first question I want to get to is, um, why does um, time enter a quantum phase transition? And we'll see a lot more of this. Ultimately, we will write down a free energy functional, just like we did for the classical case. We'll have an action, and you will see how the action uh, now incorporates time uh, derivatives as well. But the simplest answer right now is that once you have a Hamiltonian, it automatically dictates what your wave function will do. So you start with some many-body ground state psi zero, at time equal to zero, 
and that state will evolve in time dictated by this Hamiltonian. And that is not the case in classically. Classically, you can have a Hamiltonian, but you can impose many different kinds of dynamics when you want to study that dynamics in a classical system. In a quantum system, you don't have that freedom. Um, the Hamiltonian dictates that particular dynamics for the many body system. Okay, so now you may ask, okay, we did thermal transitions and we're now we are doing quantum transitions. Uh, at any, in any experiment, you will typically not be doing your experiment at zero temperature. You will be doing it at some finite temperature. So how does temperature and quantum mechanics both, how do thermal and quantum transitions, uh, you know, combine or what do they what do, what does the picture look like so here i've tried to show that so let's try to go through this um, the vertical axis is some kind of a energy scale gap or stiffness or so on the axis here is what we were just talking about the quantum critical point where this order parameter goes to zero and another gap opens up beyond that. Okay, that's what we just discussed. Now, if you look at temperature, let's look at this axis here, then on this temperature can also take your magnetic, so think of this order parameter as magnetization. So this magnetization can decrease, the magnetic order parameter can decrease because of your quantum fluctuations, it can also decrease on this side because of thermal fluctuations. Okay, and that gives us Tc. So now in an experiment, let's say you have a magnet, a quantum magnet, um, and you, its, it's uh, order parameter vanishes at Tc, and now you start including uh, the magnetic field, this transverse magnetic field that, we, that I showed you in the Hamiltonian, what it will do is it will suppress DC. Okay, oh, it will suppress DC. And at some value of the critical field, that DC will go to zero. And you would hit the quantum critical point coming down uh, with DC vanishing. Okay, so that's, this picture is what, if you could map it all out, this is what you would get for the complete uh, field and temperature uh, tuning. Okay, so now what I'm doing is, you know, this 3D plot is a little bit difficult to uh, visualize or to keep looking at. So I'm trying to redraw the temperature G plane. Okay, so this is the same picture as above, but I'm trying to redraw it here. Let me move this up. Temperature and G. So what I'm showing you is Tc decreasing and then another gap scale growing on the other side. So uh, around that Tc, just like we had thermal fluctuations, you would continue to have a small region around Tc where you would continue to get thermal fluctuations, but that region would more or less get squeezed or become very small and vanish as you approach zero temperature and the quantum critical point. So that's what would happen to thermal fluctuations. On the other hand, quantum fluctuations would grow around the critical point, extending all into finite temperatures as well. Okay, so this is an important point that quantum fluctuations don't just happen at zero temperature. The range over which you will see the quantum fluctuations will be very large the closer you are to the quantum critical point. Okay, so let me wait here and make sure everybody takes in this picture. And you know, here I have defined what are those temperature scales. So in both phases, uh, the phase below G critical and the phase above G critical, there is some energy scale delta, which is 
controlling the, uh, that phase. Typically within the phase, the temperature is less than that gap scale, right? That's when that phase is stable. In the region where temperature is bigger than that gap scale, that's where you will, that's the region where these quantum fluctuations will dominate. I'm sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just don't understand why you say that when KBT is greater than the delta, I think that region should be thermal fluctuations important because the temperature is very high. So why do you say that it's quantum fluctuation? Right, yeah. right. So of course, if you go even higher, so I, I should, there's kind of a classical regime here. I'm still, so there may, there should be another kind of, some classical temperature much, much greater than any scale. The system will just become classical. Single, yes. single mm -hmm. spin physics. But I'm trying to draw this fan diagram here. And that fan diagram says that now you're at temperatures below. So this temperature is above the gap scale. Uh, like say at that, let me look at this temperature here, right? So here I'm above the gap scale at that G value, but I'm still below some bare uh, energy scale. Do you know what I mean by bare? I mean, at G equal to zero, I have like a bare energy scale, like J bare for my interspin interaction. If the temperature is well above that J scale. Basically, the spins are single spins. They are not interacting. That's mm -hmm. the true classical regime. Mm -hmm. but now I'm at temperatures below that bare scale. So they are interacting, but I'm still above this delta scale. That's, that's the answer. Okay. D does it make sense, Yanjun? Yeah, I guess, yeah. So, so let me know. put it concretely in terms of that Hamiltonian, right? That Hamiltonian had J sigma Z sigma Z. If the temperature is above that J, okay, so let's uh, say some temp. So typically I'll show you an experiment where, where that J is about, let's say, um, 10 uh, is like, let's take a number like one millivolt. One millivolt is about 10 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So if I'm at temperatures like 100 Kelvin, I'm basically seeing classical physics. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so now let's come, now let's say you apply some H. So you have reduced your TC to 0.1 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, yeah. so 0 0.1 Kelvin, sorry, 0 0.1 uh, millivolt. So mm -hmm. at this point, uh, my temperature TC has become 1 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So if I'm now at 10, uh, say, if I'm now a little bit above that, but still below the 10 Kelvin, which was my bare coupling, mm -hmm. I'm going to be seeing uh, quantum fluctuations. Okay. That's, that's kind of the, the statement. Okay. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Okay. So um, can I ask a question? Sure. I'm having some trouble seeing what you were talking about in terms of like close to GC, there's a large range of temperatures like how am i supposed to see that from these plots i didn't put the bare scale right now the fact that you see i'm showing that region to be well below this region here right this is the bare temperature where can you see my mouse uh, i'm not seeing your mouse moving is anybody able to see my mouse I'm able to see your mouse, but it's not moving. Oh, now? No, it's just on the red text below the picture. Ah, let me stop sharing and share again. Screen share. Oh. 
Okay, now it's moving. Ah, okay. That is strange. Okay. Hmm. So you see, this is the bare temperature at G equal to zero, something above this value of TC, right? That's at temperatures that are well above the bare energy scale. Because what is TC at G equal to zero? TC is of order J, right? We've all seen that. So if I'm at temperatures well above this TC, then um, I'm well above the bare energy scale and the system is more or less classical. This quantum critical regime is happening at temperatures above the gap scale at, the, um, at this reduced gap scale due to the quantum fluctuations, but still below that bare scale. Okay. So um, let's uh, go to a couple of examples now. Um, I'm going to show you three, okay, so I may not do all of this, but there are some really nice materials where people have seen these transitions. So um, let me um, just stop for a bit and see, do people have any other questions about this broad idea of quantum phase transitions that we are going to look at temperature and another variable? And we are going to see the temperature scale, uh, t the transition scale dip down, go to zero, define a quantum critical point, and then we are going to analyze the behavior around that. Um, I, I, have, I have a question. Go ahead, Sandeep. Okay, uh, I, I still have a doubt regarding this, uh, comparing the energy scale delta and KBT. I would assume that if delta, like KBT is less than delta, then the thermal fluctuation cannot mix up the ground state and excited state. So we will need a quantum description and vice versa. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I don't know, I'm, I'm missing something. Uh, so, so um, maybe wait a bit, I will give you a particular example. So here's the thing, okay. No, I think this is important. So let me reiterate. Um, when the, so let's look at the three regimes, okay? Mm -hmm. So in the regime for G less than GC, delta is a gap scale in that phase. So let's say it's, it's an ordered phase with a gap. If you're at temperatures below that gap, right? Where has the quantum mechanics come in? The quantum mechanics has come in in already creating a new ground state with the reduced gap. Okay. Right? The original system had, had a certain larger gap. The, when I'm looking at a value of G below G critical, the quantum mechanics has already come in in suppressing that gap. Okay? Now, the temperatures are below that gap scale. So whatever this new ground state is, is stable. Okay. It's not, fluctu it's small fluctuations, uh, which are a combination of thermal and, you know, so the fluctuations are small, but now you have re reconfigured a new ground state. Mm -hmm. When you go above that, you have, um, fluctuations of, uh, so when you go above that gap scale, now you can get uh, your, I see what your question is. Your point is now thermal fluctuations should be really large. I think yeah. this is what was Yan Jun's question yeah, yeah. as well. Now thermal fluctuations should be really large. Yeah. There is a regime though, where the quantum fluctuations really dominate the uncertainty is going to dominate those thermal fluctuations. So keep this picture in mind, a real example will help. Mm -hmm. But it, it is something that we will come back to. See, it's not that high temperatures always has large quantum fluctuations. You have to be near the quantum critical point. So uh, there was a shaded so, region in the graph that you had 
shown yeah. us before. So is this related to that? I mean, yes. when the temperature is in that shaded region. That's right. It's, it's not always that high temperature is doing this. What you are doing, it's again a question of being near the quantum critical point G. Exactly as you're saying that, you know, if I'm at, let's say this temperature, uh, so if I keep going up higher and higher in temperature, you might say, where does this stop? Okay, mm -hmm. let's ask that question. You have to look at, again, energy scales and time scales. Okay, sorry, uh, length scales and time scales. So there's a correlation length. The correlation length is diverging at the critical point, which means, and also the correlation time is diverging which basically means I can go to very high temperatures and still be within the window of that diverging scale. As I move away from that critical point, if you go to length scales beyond the, you know, the length scale is now not diverging, it's something finite. So if you probe the physics at, uh, you know, at scales which are within that diverging length scale, now you will start to see cutoffs in the range of temperatures over which quantum fluctuations will matter. It's the closer you are to the critical point, the larger the range of temperatures over which you will see quantum fluctuations. So is this like a crossover rather than a sharp transition as you go up in temperature? Yeah. I mean, the sharp transition is happening at this red line. These are, all fluctuations are regions, right? Even thermal fluctuations are regions. Basically, it says that there will be critical behavior observed. Uh, and as you know from thermal fluctuations, we saw that, um, you know, when you come near the critical point, the, you will start to see critical fluctuations, but the question is how close to the critical point, right? So it's the same thing here. At GC, you will see critical behavior all the way on and on. Little below GC, you will see it up to some range, but then it'll get cut off because your length scale is finite and time scale is finite. So then why? Why is it that when you're exactly at GC, why doesn't the, uh, the, this critical behavior go up all the way up to T equals infinity? It does. I mean, I'm just saying it, it does. I mean, in principle, it does, right? But there'll be other cutoffs. If you're precise, see in any experiment, you can't really tune that precisely. Yeah, but technically, I mean, mathematically, your correlation length is infinite at GC. And so it will go on mathematically to temperature equal to infinity. That behavior will persist. Okay, good. Um, so I we, have a yeah. last question. So uh, G, the parameter G decreases TC for the classical transition, right? Um, but does T decrease the value of GC at all or no? Decrease like the you, value of G critical? Yeah. No, G critical is defined as the critical coupling at zero temperature. Okay. Okay, great. So let's uh, go to the next. Okay, we discussed that. Uh, so here is one example. I thought I would show you this. Um, it's not the transverse fieldizing model. I'm going to come to that. But the data for that is a little bit harder to uh, understand. Uh, this is a different system. It's a superconductor. Um, it's a superconductor bismuth. And it's a very thin superconductor. And uh, so you can, so you, let's look at one of the thick films. So this is a 74 angstrom film. The vertical axis is the resistance, what is called sheet resistance, okay? Um, as a function of temperature. And so you see that at 
high temperatures, it's metallic with some finite resistance. In two dimensions, resistance and resistivity is the same, has the same units. Um, we don't need to go into that. Uh, but in any case, um, it has a certain resistance and that drops, oh, that drops to zero at TC, which is a little above five Kelvin. You see that? You can see my mouse, right? Okay. Think of G as some parameter. It could be thickness, it could be disorder, it could be some other magnetic field. It's one of those quantum tuning parameters. As you increase it, so in this case, it is disorder in the film. As you increase that, um, the, the resistance even in the normal state goes up. Okay, as you would expect, if it's disorder, the resistance is going up and TC drops. Now TC is lower than five point something. It has decreased a bit. And they make a whole sequence of these films. And you can see that at, in the normal state, the resistance is going up and up and up. But like, look at these two films. They are very close in behavior at high temperatures. But as you go to low temperatures, one of them dips down and becomes superconducting with a very small TC. And the other one is marching up and diverging with a very high resistance. So this becomes insulating. So you're seeing a, trans a transition from a superconductor to an insulator as you change a non-thermal parameter G. This is an example of a quantum phase transition. Let me replot the data in the way we have been talking about. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put temperature on the vertical axis and G on the horizontal axis. And I'm going to plot these TCs as they come down. So I don't have the data to do that, but this is the kind of thing you will see. This is uh, the, the data I showed you is the classic data from um, uh, Alan Goldman's group in 89, which basically gave birth to this big field of superconductor to insulator transition. Um, and this was a big deal because before that, actually Anderson himself had um, shown that when you have a small amount of disorder, a superconductor is robust and nothing should happen to it. Uh, and that was a good statement. Uh, it's even called Anderson's theorem, but you know, theorems are theorems in physics. It was not a proof. So his was a statement that nothing should happen at very low disorder. But this field uh, started in uh, 89 with Goldman's experiment where he was able to take the disorder to extremely large values well beyond the perturbative regime and show that no, something did happen. The system in fact made a phase transition from a superconductor to an insulator. And that was a quantum phase transition. So this is the kind of picture you can see now by 2007, there's even very, very high quality data uh, with many more data, much more data near the critical conductance showing one set dipping down, another set marching up toward high uh, resistances. So what we are talking about now is replotting this data, temperature on the vertical axis, disorder or G on the horizontal axis, and we see that TC is coming down, goes to zero, vanishes at G critical. There's a dotted line I've shown on the other side and what that energy scale is, I'll come to later when we talk about uh, superconductor insulator transitions. But there will be an energy scale in the insulator which also vanishes at that critical point. And between these two regions in the middle here, is the quantum critical region, which will show fluctuations dominated by this G critical, which basically means that if we analyze the behavior in this quantum critical region, we can get scaling and exponents controlled by this critical point. That's the meaning of a quantum critical region. The fluctuations in that region 
are controlled by some fixed point. Which one is it? It's not this TC that controls it. It's this G critical that controls it. So that's really the meaning of a quantum critical region. Okay. And uh, let me show the, the scaling there. Um, that same data that we saw, you know, many, many curves as a function of uh, uh, temperature for many different Gs, you can take all of that data. So this is like 17 different temperatures, but, and you can take all of that data and put it on a scaling plot. Maybe I should minimize this. Okay, can you see this? This is, this is kind of the prep work I had given everyone. I'm extending the time for that because it was a little too quick to get, get it all done today. But this is the kind of plot I want you to think about for the classical Ising model, um, trying to put data on many different temperatures and magnetic fields for the magnetization behavior and putting it on two scaling plot, two um, universal plots like this. And that's what they have done here for the quantum phase transition. So what is shown here is the resistance as a function of a scaled variable. This is not just the um, uh, G parameter, but it is G, this, this variable is G minus G critical. And then there's a temperature which is scaled with some particular exponent here where nu and Z enter the dynamical exponent and the correlation length exponent. So you define a rescaled X variable. And now remarkably, you see that all the plots on one of the sides, so the insulating side uh, goes on the top curve and all the other ones on the superconducting side go on the lower one. And this is a lot of different data and each symbol here is for different temperatures. So this is a very powerful plot which helps you understand uh, the quantum critical behavior controlled by G critical. So the meaning of this, I will discuss again in more detail after you guys have done your scaling plots. And then we will put the two together and discuss what does scaling mean. We have spent a lot of time trying to get uh, do the RG equations and get the eigenvalues and get the exponents. But there is more to the scaling than just exponents. This entire scaling function is also universal. Okay. Okay. Um, so now I think, uh, should we take a short breather and uh, then I can start uh, getting into now the quantum Ising model. Okay, let's take a break for like a few yeah. minutes, three minutes, and then we can begin. Uh, I have I a question. question. Yeah, go ahead. Each person who has a question start. Who will be first? Yep. Uh, since you started, yeah. Xiaozhou, you go ahead. So uh, in the experiment of the superconductor, uh, what will happen when we reach the critical quantum regime? Uh, um, what will happen is right here if you are at zero let's say we are at zero temperature yes if you are below g critical so like if this is disorder if you are less disordered than g critical it will be a superconductor yeah i mean in the quantum critical regime oh in the quantum critical regime yeah yes so uh, I will come to an actual picture of the superconductor. And basically, it will be a regime where you will get uh, fluctuations of the order parameter, but not. So this is one uh, thing to 
keep in mind that whenever we have been talking about fluctuations, right? Our picture was you have a magnet and temperature is making that magnet fluctuate, the, the direction fluctuate, let's say. Let's yes. say it's one of those uh, O2 models. A superconductor is pretty much like an O2 model. Okay. Now, thermally, we have understood that these fluctuations happen and the length scale over which these puddles of fluctuations form is the correlation length. Now, we will also have tunneling of these fluctuations. Yes. So in the quantum critical regime, the new thing will be that your magnet or your superconductor can tunnel from pointing in this direction to pointing in that direction in time. Okay, I see. So that is what will happen here. There will be spatial fluctuations, but also yes. tunneling of the phase from one direction to another direction. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's good to have some of these pictures in mind before we get into the math. Because uh, again, um, you know, to extract all of these pictures from the math will take some time. So I don't mind spending some time just going over these, um, you know, just so in our minds we understand these pictures. Um, so I have a question about this. So when you're in the quantum critical region, uh, you said you have tunneling, so that will destroy the order, right? So yes. that will be another phase? So that is why it's not another phase, but that is why the quantum critical region has no long range order, right? It's, it's, it's above the superconductor, it's here. And it mm -hmm. is because of the quantum tunneling uh, from one region to another, that the long range order has been destroyed. Yes, so can we define that as like some kind of other phase that's different from the superconductor and different from this later? Yes, that is what is, it's called the quantum critical region. In that region, you'll be able to scale all your data um, uh, on that curve like I showed you. Okay, um, I have another question. So you said that the uh, the time, the time scale is like the time uh, you use to do the quantum tunneling, right? Yes. Uh, if we exactly at the GC, that means that the time diverges. That yeah. means that it's not possible to turn in from one state to another state. So that will stay in like symmetry breaking state? Uh, no. Uh, I know what you're saying, but the point is, there are many regions, right? So, uh -huh. um, um, so a good way to think about it is critical slowing down, which is something that happened even in classical transitions, right? When uh, Changyan and Shoyantan were doing their Monte Carlo, they found that in the Monte Carlo, they were not able to uh, explore all of phase space ergodically because the system got stuck in some region and they had to make moves which were on the scale of the correlation length. Here, mm -hmm. uh, a similar thing will happen. There will be, you know, if every, so let's, let's not look at C equal to infinity, but let's look at C equal to large. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if mm -hmm. C is large, then in that, so you have, let's say, some order parameter in that region, and mm -hmm. it's trying, it will be tunneling into another region uh, with a different direction of the order parameter. So if you average everything, it is still zero. But the mm -hmm. time scale it will take you to go from one region to another will become very long. That's right. The tunneling time scale. So mm -hmm. That's why in any experiment, there'll be a cutoff because your experiment will not run for infinite time. There will be some rounding. Okay. And that is why this kind of phenomena is captured on a scaling plot. Because on a scaling plot, you, uh, I will explain what those different points uh, get there. Uh, you know, what are the different temperatures and uh, couplings that contribute to different regions on the scale plot? But 
you will approach the critical point. You will never kind of be at the critical point. Okay. So I, I have a question. Uh, so classically, um, if, if um, suppose the system is uh, in some equilibrium state, uh, it can still go to all of the other equilibrium, uh, other states with the same energy, but uh, but that hopping is already determined by temperature, uh, the the speed of that hopping, if you will, in in the equilibrium system. So here that that parameter is different, and that is why it's interesting. Yes, is, is it so the correct difference? That's, like, that's exactly the uh, correct thing. So think of two wells with a barrier, right? If you classically, if you're sitting in one of the wells and you want to go to the other well, you have to go above the barrier, right? Only then you can cross over and go to the other well. Quantum mechanically, you could be at zero temperatures because you're not going over the barrier at all. You're tunneling from one to the other. So you could just be at zero temperatures. Your particle is, a, is like a packet, right? Wave packet sitting in that well and it can quantum tunnel to the other well. No, uh, uh, but I have trouble reconciling these pictures because the free energy is written for the entire system, not for a single particle. It's like the entire system moves from one well to another. So when I say uh, it's a, a particle, it's not really that particle. It, the magnetization is okay. a classical variable. You can think of the two, the, you, the particle is not one spin. It's the collective mode. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So the fact that it can tunnel to a different state means that, you know, it, it, it has the same, like, it's like there's a degeneracy, so it can move from one state to another state. Assume that there was no ground state degeneracy. I mean, would the same physics hold through or is it like this ground state degeneracy or like more than one kind of a classically possible state is necessary for? Yeah, uh, this in this class of quantum phase transitions, um, you it's this, the Hamiltonian has a higher symmetry and the low temperature phase breaks that symmetry. It's um, it break, uh, it, that is the whole idea of emergence, that your high temperature phase has, let's say, full rotational invariance, you know, but the low temperature freight spontaneously breaks that symmetry. So that basically means you have multiple degenerate states that, and one of them gets picked out. Um. Excuse me, uh, I have a question regarding this plot. So, um, so uh, the thing is, so is it necessary to have degenerate ground states to have this kind of a uh, 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 ground state uh, reconstruction? Because, uh, so what if I have two states that, like, just uh, think of a system which has only two states, and uh, and. Uh, as you go on uh, tuning some parameter in the Hamiltonian, there is a level crossing at some point at the critical point. So the system moves from state one to state two as it goes through this critical point. So is can that be a uh, can that be called as a quantum phase transition? Uh, that so again, you uh, so long as you have to have many degrees of freedom. That's one very important point to get symmetry breaking. You must have many many degrees of freedom only then you get symmetry breaking, right? That is the whole point of phase transitions do not occur in uh, finite systems. So you do need uh, infinite degrees of freedom. Uh, the second thing, now even in infinite degrees of freedom, as you were saying, uh, can you get a level crossing, right? So you can have, mm -hmm. let's say a many body ground state um, and you know you have some uh, eigen spectrum, and you have just some level crossing. That is a an a way to get a first order transition. So you would never get this here. What you see, it's a continuous phase transition. 
um, with TC going down all continuously to zero. So this would not happen in a level crossing scenario. Okay, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay, good. No, so, sorry. Yeah. Chuang. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, uh, I want to ask, how do you define the term quantum critical region? Because it's just the continuum region without any critical exponents, without any phase transition. So what, what's the definition of that? Uh, no, it's not without any exponents. You know, that data I showed you where it was scaling, right? So all that data, uh, the, let me just go back. All of this data, right? Um, so the critical point is, he, this is the critical value of G critical, which separates a superconductor uh, behavior from an insulator. So that is G critical. Now, around that, so if your uh, resistance is controlled by exponents at that G critical point, and those exponents are going to be nu and Z and exponents of that kind, just like we had for the classical critical phenomena, now with the added exponent of the dynamical exponent Z. If it is a quantum critical point, all the data should scale in a particular way. And that's what is shown here. Okay, so that's the def, in a way you can use this as a demonstration of there being a quantum critical point. This is not the only way to define it, but this is an operational way to define it for an experiment. Okay. Okay. So it is also true that if you go to data very far from the critical point, it will not fall on just these two curves. It will start having non-universal physics. So in other words, you're looking at, like if I look at data, you know, this further away data here and here are less likely to fall on those uni universal uh, curves. It's really criticality is a statement about um, behavior near this critical uh, exponent. So you see the point I'm trying to make is there is a phase transition happening at TC. This is the thermal phase transition. So you can, you can do two kinds of analysis. You say, okay, I have a superconductor or a magnet and it became uh, disordered or um, it, at this finite temperature. This is in our magnetic language, this would be a magnet to paramagnet transition at some critical temperature. So you can yeah. sit and analyze this behavior according to exponents for the finite temperature critical point. Okay, that's yeah. a, a, an analysis. And then you can now do that for every temperature, right? And it does, since TC doesn't really matter, we always analyze the behavior around TC, the same exponent will describe each of these finite temperature transitions. Okay, but yeah. At some point, you will see that the, uh, the quantum, there will be deviations on the, how much of that finite temperature region around that temperature can be fitted with the classical scaling behavior. And that's when you will realize that another critical point is actually controlling the behavior with another exponent Z. And that's when this kind of plot will be a demonstration of a quantum phase transition. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, are there any, yeah. Yeah, so are there any interesting properties about the quantum critical regime, like apart from it being like the quantum fluctuations are dominating. So does that mean that I'm going to get some exotic state or anything like that? Um, in some exotic state. Um, well, uh, and something, yeah. 
Yeah, I think in terms of tunneling, it's a very beautiful picture that will emerge. So I'm going to come to that with okay. some more math. So here's what I'm okay. planning to do. I'm actually going to, not today, but today I want to do the transverse fieldizing model. Uh, but next mm -hmm. time I was going to do a zero dimensional problem, quantum problem, just zero, meaning one spin and show, write down the path integral in time. So you can start to get an idea about this quantum tunneling. Okay. Okay. So let's start. At least let me, I know we are, we've kind of uh, gone over a bit, but that's okay. This part, I'm always very keen that the beginning be slow because otherwise, you know, that's kind of when you're learning a new thing and the idea, questions are kind of important. Let me now tell you, um, at least give you a sketch of the transverse field Ising model. And a lot of it is are things you can also do on your own from my notes. So here's the model, as we talked about. Um, it can be solved exactly. So that's the first thing I want to do. Uh, the second thing I want to do is perturbation in H and perturbation in J from the two extremes. And then I want to show you the experiment. Okay, so I won't go through this exact solution. This is something you can just sit down and work it out, but I'll tell you the idea. Okay, so the idea is, so this model is being written in one dimension. So that's the first thing that should alert you. We know in one dimension, there's no phase transition thermally for the Ising model, but already you're going to see in one dimension, for this quantum Ising model, there will be a phase transition. Okay, so that's the first interesting thing. And the way it is solved exactly is by a beautiful mapping of the spin problem to a particle problem. Particle meaning fermion problem. Spinless fermions. So Pauli matrices have two states, right? Up and down. So you can kind of see that there should be a natural way to map spin half objects to fermions. The only problem is they don't obey the same commutation relations. So you have to do something a uh, little more non-trivial there. And that is what is called the Jordan-Wigner transformation. So this is a transformation that will ultimately map these spin operators to fermion operators, C's and C dagger. Okay, and I will explain that, but I'm going to just march ahead and give you the main idea. So what the first step is that this Hamiltonian, the ZZ, I'm just going to do a trivial rotation of my axes and make it into like um, uh, an X operator and convert the X operator into a Z operator. So I'm doing a rotation about the Y axis and rotating a Z to X and X to Z. And the reason is this Z operator, I want to make into like a particle density operator and the X operators will become like fermion hopping operators from site I to site I plus one. Some of you may be getting more of an idea because you have been working with fermions but that's kind of the idea. This will become like a density operator. This will be a hopping operator. But as I said, there's a little bit of a problem because they don't obey the same commutation relations. So the transformation is a bit non-trivial in that the Z operator becomes a density operator, CI dagger CI, but the X and Y operators, so TI minus, is uh, a spin uh, lowering operator at site I. It's a spin flip. So up spin flips to down. That becomes like a, a fermion destruction operator, except there is a string attached to it. And the string ensures that spins on different sites commute. You see, fermions on different sites anti-commute but spins on different sites commute. So that difference is encounter, is corrected by this kind of a string operator. So what I suggest is you guys take a look at this algebra 
and make sure you can understand that the end result of that is that you get a Hamiltonian. So you just go through that algebra, which I have reproduced here in quite some detail. Uh, but the end result is that you get a Hamiltonian, which has just quadratic terms. Uh, CI dagger, CI plus one dagger, or CI, CI plus one, or CI dagger, CI. Okay, so if you have a quadratic Hamiltonian, it's like Gaussian integrals and quadratic Hamiltonians, these are exactly solved. And so I have given you the exact solution of this. Uh, I go into momentum space, exactly solve it. Let me give you the end result. Um, end result is really beautiful. Uh, those of you who have been, uh, who have been looking at some uh, maybe all of you would have done something like a spin in a magnetic field in your quantum class, right? Have you done that problem? A single spin in a magnetic field and bury phases and so on. So that's yeah. the kind of Hamiltonian you get. Your Hamiltonian can be reduced in this spinner space. I define a, an, a, a wave, a, a state a CK and a DK. DK is basically a whole operator. So there are two bands in this problem. So CK and let me just write down here. I've done, in order to get it in the really nice quadratic form, I have to do a particle hole transformation. In some languages, we call it the Bogliobov transformation. And that then takes us to this Hamiltonian in a two by two form. And that Hamiltonian can exactly be written as uh, Fk, which is given by these coefficients here, dotted with sigma. This two by two form can be put into this structure. And so the eigenspectrum has two bands given here at the bottom. And what I suggest is uh, you guys go through this algebra and plot this spectrum as a function of h perp divided by j. And then let's look at it next time. Um, basically, you will see that there is a gap at small values of h perp over j less than a critical value and a gap above it. And a gap will close exactly at the transition, something like this. So I want you to do this uh, by yourselves and uh, let's pick up on it uh, next time. And what is beautiful about this field is uh, there's an experiment on a real material, a cobalt based material where um, they have seen um, this kind of a quantum phase transition and much more. I want to just end by showing you that data. Let me skip ahead a bit. But this is the experiment I'm talking about. So, you know, in this business, it can take a while for the theory, the experiment, and everything to come together. But just even look at the title, Quantum Criticality in an Ising Chain, Experimental Emergence of E8 Symmetry. E8 is a Lie group, a continuous Lie group. We have encountered U1, which was the O2 symmetry the phase of the complex order parameter. This is a higher order Lie group. And in this system, you know, you might say, well, what on earth are they talking about? This is some material. But in this system, uh, which is a cobalt based uh, chain, uh, they can, using neutron scattering and the excitation spectrum, they are able to reveal this E8 symmetry. So that is where I'll pick up next time. Uh, go through the solution, we will discuss it, and then we will discuss the experiments and uh, go toward a bit toward this E8 symmetry. Okay, that's it for the lecture today. I'll just wait here a bit, uh, take more questions. And those of you who have questions about the projects, I'll still be online for some time discussing that. So uh, uh, with the jordan Wigner transformation, are we looking at the excitation spectrum? Uh, we like, can, yeah, we are getting the full spectrum. 
because uh, it's a quadratic yeah, problem. It's a quadratic problem. Yeah. We can get the full spectrum. Okay. And the full because spectrum. Because here each, yeah. Yeah, because each fermion is like creating a spin excitation. So like spin flips or. That's right. So we will try to, un so here's the point. This is the spectrum that you get as a function of momentum, right? And let's yes. say at any value of H, let's pick something like H equal to J over four. So the black curve, okay? This is basically saying that at K equal to zero, so this is giving you the excitation spectrum. There's some ground state, and yes. this is the excitation above that. And at K equal to zero, the gap is the smallest right here um as you change so you just focus on this gap at k equal to zero as you increase j at j over two the gap closes at yeah. j over uh, h equal to three j over four the gap opens again but the meaning of these gaps will be different we have to look at the eigen function to understand what okay. these gaps mean. And that's what I will do next time. Okay. You can also try that. Uh, think about the problem at uh, perturbatively, at small g and very large g, and try to understand the problem perturbatively. So, yeah, okay. More questions? Okay, um, I, let me just, uh, so one quick question is, I see only, I know, I see everybody. Yeah, let me just, um, okay, I see everybody, how many people joined? 17, okay. Uh, one more person didn't join today. Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, anybody else has questions? Is there a good, um textbook reference or anything? Yeah, again, go back to my um, class, um, you know, syllabus. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is this quantum phase transitions by Subir Sachdev. That's going to be kind of the reference. Okay. But uh, some of these experiments that I'm showing, uh, so like this uh, Columbite experiment happened uh, in 2010. I think that's after the book was written. So, I see. Okay. and uh, some of the superconductor insulator may not be there, right? Okay. Yeah. More questions by anybody? Okay. Um, okay, good. So, um, I think this part, uh, we have just uh, not too many lectures left. Uh, but I think uh, once I get across the tunneling idea mathematically, pretty much the idea of a quantum phase transition will be clear. And uh, once we do this one example very well, I'm a big believer of not trying to do too much, uh, like, you know, just um, impressionistically, but doing like a few things very, very well. Uh, it gives a good grip on the problem. So please do the prep work for the scaling behavior in the classical problem. Because uh, that is, that's why I'm not rushing it today. Uh, you can take your time. The, I have notes on that, uh, scaling using two variables. I have put up those notes long back. You can use that for reference, but try to do that uh, yourself and try to understand that scaling behavior. It is um, seemingly a bit abstract, uh, but once you understand how different temperatures, where they fall on the scaling plot, I will make it even more interesting in the quantum case. Um, but without that legwork, it will be a little bit lost if I just do it. 
That's why I'm waiting for you guys to do it. Okay, that's it for now. And I'll uh, stay on if anybody wants to continue talking about their projects. We can even do it collectively. People may want to hear each other. Okay, so officially, bye-bye. The class has ended. Let me try to see if I can stop the recording.